Welcome to Good Books Radio. I'm Dr. W.F. Strong. I'm your host this week. And today we talk the birds. Uh, we have a wonderful book called The Thing with Feathers, written by Noah Stryker. Subtitle is informative. It is The Surprising Lives of Birds and What They Reveal About Being Human. Good Books Radio is made possible by a generous grant from audiobooks.com, which you can try for free. You can download any of uh, thousands of books there. It's easy to download and easy to listen, and it's free. Our author today, as I said, is Noah Stryker. The book is The Thing with Birds, the th- oh, excuse me, The Thing with Feathers, and um, we have him on the line now. Noah, how are you this morning? I'm doing great. Thank you. The title, The Thing with Feathers, isn't that from a Dickinson poem? That's correct. It's from an Emily Dickinson poem. And it means hope, right? Yeah, it's it's all about hope, pretty mm-hmm. much. You're familiar with Woody Allen's book? <laughs> Vaguely. Well, he has a book called Without Feathers. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so, so you're in good company playing on Emily's um, uh, line. The And you also, I mean, you talk about a great name for a birder, Noah, one of the first great relationships with birds. Uh, yeah, and you know, there's a movie coming out about me. I'm going to be played by <laughs> Russell Crowe, I guess. <laughs> if you've seen the Hollywood movie, Noah is coming out. Yes, I saw. You're, you know, you're going to be well represented there by Russell Crowe. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it's not your mama's story of Noah in the Ark, though, so we'll see. <laughs> well, I'm interested because I heard yesterday that he said that uh, he, he had never been so moved by a role, and so I'm, I'm interested to see what, what uh, so moved him. Oh, wow. Uh, well, me too. I mean, I can't imagine him doing uh, something better than Gladiators, which in my mind is the you know, the best <laughs> film ever made. It was pretty good, I have to say. <laughs> the, uh, oh, but let's talk about your book. One of the things I, I like about your book is it has great stories in it. So let's first talk about pigeons. Clearly, you think pigeons are among the smartest creatures, uh, in at least in the bird world and maybe in the world. Uh, what, what I'm makes not sure I'd go so far as to say they're the most intelligent birds in the mm-hmm. world, at least by our definitions. But uh-huh. I think pigeons are pretty interesting birds. Uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to study birds in some of the world's most remote places over the past few years. But you have to remember that birds are all around us and that we often tend to ignore birds like pigeons and starlings because they're so-called trash birds in the city and they don't get much respect. Mm-hmm. But they do pretty interesting things as well. Well, one of the things that you talk about in the chapter on pigeons is, first of all, that uh, what what surprised me is you actually found a pigeon and was able to track it to its owner. How is that possible? I was out bird watching in southeast Oregon in this remote desert oasis last year, mm-hmm. and I came across a pigeon wandering around the parking lot that had some bands on its legs, and it was super tame, so tame that I walked over to it and just picked it up. And then I had this live pigeon in my hands, and I realized it was a lost racing pigeon, a homing pigeon, and I I whipped out my iPhone, and I typed in the digits on the bird's leg into Google, and like two clicks later, I called up the guy who owned this bird named Marty. He lived over in Idaho, about 150 miles away as the pigeon flies, and Marty told me that this particular pigeon had gone missing during a training run for a pigeon race a couple weeks before. So that wow. was great. That, that is astounding that you can just uh, take a number off a band and, and locate the owner just like that. That, that. It's amazing how pigeons navigate. They mm-hmm. can find their way home from hundreds, sometimes even thousands of miles away, and and this guy, Marty, told me it's pretty unusual for his his birds to go missing, and it's true. Pigeons don't make navigational errors very often, and even this one probably could still find its way home. It may have just taken a detour on the way. As far as we know, pigeons can navigate using all their senses, you know, visual, but also using the position of the sun and the stars, and then even things that we can't even really comprehend, like they can detect the Earth's magnetic field like they have some kind of compass built into their head. Well, you mentioned there's a couple of places in the world where you know that uh, pigeons lose that ability. Where is that? You'll see these news articles every now and then about so-called bird muta triangles. (laughs) Bird muta (laughs) triangles. There's one in England, I guess, and one in northern New York. And Uh it seems that maybe the pigeons are getting messed up in those areas because of maybe variations in 
the magnetic lines in those areas, um, or possibly the latest theory is that there could be disturbances in infrasound, in other words, ultra-low frequency sound waves that can travel hundreds of miles, like mm. from distant coastlines of waves breaking on beaches, and, and pigeons can probably use even those low frequency waves to navigate as well. Amazing. Yeah. What, what is the most uh, astounding uh, story you've heard of a bird that traveled great distances to get home? Well, I'll tell you two. Okay. I think the all-time most lost award for any pigeon is probably one that went missing during a pigeon race in England a few years back and ended up on a rooftop in Panama City, Panama, oh. <laughs> 5,000 miles from home. And they thought that it had probably fluttered down on a container ship going the wrong direction. No. <laughs> But there are records of pigeons making it home from more than 2,000 miles away, which is pretty extraordinary. Yes. And I should add that at that distance, it's more of a survival run for a pigeon trying to make it home. And so most pigeon races are, are much shorter, on the range of a few hundred miles, maybe up to about 900 miles or so. Yeah, talk about this uh, race you have in Africa. I'd never, I'd never even heard of pigeon races before, and this, this evidently uh, it's a big deal. The whole world of pigeon racing is kind of crazy. People mm -hmm. get super into it. You know, pigeons were used for racing and delivering messages long ago um, before things like radio came along. But now it's become more of a hobby and a sport. And in the ultra-high-stakes world of pigeon racing, thousands and thousands of dollars are bet on these races, and the winners, the pigeons, can be sold off for hundreds of thousands of dollars, and celebrities like Mike Tyson get involved. <laughs> Apparently he has a thing for pigeons. There's a big race in Africa every year where people will send in their young pigeon chicks, and then they will be raised all in this one spot and trained to the same loft so that they can all race the same route. The thing with a typical pigeon race is that pigeons are all trained to go home. So mm -hmm. if you want to race your pigeons against your friends who lives in a different spot, you just have to take them the same distance from home and then time how long it takes them to get home. And it's that highest average speed that wins. Is there any... Um any way that people can test as to whether that's the actual bird? Yeah, they put bands on them uh -huh. so that they can identify them. And lately they put computer chips in bands around their legs, so they actually just get scanned as uh -huh. they come into their loft. So cheating's not really possible, but I'm sure 200 years ago it was. <laughs> I'm sure there have been <laughs> epic cheats in the world of pigeon racing, but it's getting harder and harder. Do you do, you do that? I've never raced pigeons, and I was only vaguely aware of this whole thing until I found this bird in mm. southeast Oregon a couple of years ago. But it's it's a pretty fascinating hobby. Well, you know, well, you had to know something to know to look for the band, because I certainly wouldn't have known to look for anything, and then I wouldn't have known I could pick it up. It took, I have to say, it took me a minute to realize what was going on until something clicked in my head, and I was like, wait, this pigeon is super tame, and it's hundreds of miles from the nearest McDonald's. Uh -huh. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the stories you tell that I love is uh, how uh, Rothschild uh, may have developed, uh, may have earned some of his wealth due to a pigeon. How is that? Yeah, they, uh, a pigeon carried a message about a military battle, um, and it was the, f the fastest way of getting the news. And so Count Rothschild got this information about how the campaign had gone before other people were able to and made some quick-thinking financial decisions, the story goes, and amassed a considerable fortune based on this quick knowledge that he got from a homing pigeon. So this was essentially Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, and, mm -hmm. and he got this information, and then he shorted the market. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and made a killing. Well, I mean, it's always that way. Information is power, right? That's right. Yeah. Now, the uh, you talk also, we, we go, let's leave pigeons behind for a bit and go to starlings. This also is, uh, these are what you call, or referred to as uh, sometimes people think of as trash birds. But uh, they have some unique skills. Well, starlings here in the U.S. are not native, and they tend to live around cities, and so, yeah, they, they tend not to get much respect. Mm -hmm. But starlings are also pretty interesting birds, and one thing they do 
is they make these huge flocks, usually in the winter, usually at dusk, just before they go to their roost for the evening, that can sometimes contain up to a million individual starlings in one very tight, dense flock that swirls around the sky, kind of like a tornado or a smoke cloud or something. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing to watch. If you go on YouTube and type in murmuration, Mm -hmm. which is just the collective noun for a big group of starlings, you'll get these amazing videos of starlings doing these patterns of flocking. I'd actually and, seen that video before I read your book, so I you know, connected immediately to that uh, fantastic image of those starlings uh, shifting shapes in the sky. Yeah, that video went viral, I think, in November 2011 when mm-hmm. the Huffington Post linked to it, and it's had mm-hmm. millions of views. And I think that's what's interesting about bird behavior in general. You know, it's not some dry subject for an ornithology textbook. Mm-hmm. It's murmurations of starlings going viral on YouTube, things that birds mm-hmm. do that really capture our attention. Now, why do they do that? We don't really know mm-hmm. why starlings make these big flocks. Uh, maybe it's to avoid predators or just burn off some extra energy before going to bed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who knows? But it's just impossible to sit there and watch them without wondering, how do they all manage not to bump into each other and yeah. fall out of the sky? And for a long time, we didn't know anything about how starling flocks worked. It's hard to study them. It's like trying to study a tornado in action or something. <laughs> but there was this group of Italian physicists a couple of years ago who studied starling flocks over Rome by using stereoscopic photography, in other words, two different cameras spaced about 100 yards apart, And then they came up with a computer algorithm that could match these different pictures taken at the same time together, and that way model a flock of starlings. And they came up with some startling conclusions where they said that mathematically these flocks of starlings behave kind of similarly to very different things, like avalanches breaking loose from mountains and pieces of iron becoming spontaneously magnetized. Wow. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff. And then one of these guys developed an actual um, imitative model of what they were doing, and that worked its way into movies, right? Well, what they realized was that particle physics is actually a pretty good framework for studying starling flocks and flocks of birds in general. If you think of every individual bird as a particle that just behaves according to certain rules of the universe— Mm -hmm. and there's no leaders in the flock, it's very organic, then you can try to come up with what the rules are. And so what they did is they animated a group of random particles on a computer just by assigning them three rules. Don't get too far from the main group, don't get too close to your nearest neighbors, and align your direction with your nearest six or seven neighbors. And if you assign inanimate particles those three rules, they start to act amazingly similar to a flock of flying birds. And so that's been used to model and animate flocks of birds and other creatures in Hollywood movies. And one of the guys you mentioned in the book got uh, an Academy Award for achievement in technology, right? Yeah, it was a pretty big breakthrough being able to animate a very lifelike swarm of birds is, uh, I guess, much more difficult than you might think. Well, do you think when I watch a bird, for instance, uh, we have a lot of wind in this part of the world, and I'll see birds out just uh, uh, surfing, kind of. Are they just having fun? I think birds do have fun and play sometimes. Um, They may not have quite as much free time as we do, (laughs) but, yeah, birds have a sense of fun and play. And I saw a video the other day of a crow getting on a little piece of plastic and surfing it down a rooftop. And then when it got to the bottom, it would pick the piece of plastic up and go back to the top and (laughs) do it again. (laughs) And I've seen penguins do the same thing, where they'll go to the top of a snow field on a good powder day, and they'll sled down face first on their tummies like they're sledding. And then when they get to the bottom, they pop back up to their feet and walk back up to the top and (laughs) do it again. What what about uh, intelligence? You know, over the past few, I guess the past decade or so, uh, it's come to my attention that we used to think of parrots, for instance, as being just mimics. But now there are those arguing, no, they're really intelligent. I think that two groups of birds in particular, uh, magpies and crows and ravens, which are in a group of birds called the corvids, Mm -hmm. 
and the group of birds that includes the parrots mm -hmm. are probably the most intelligent birds on earth, at least according to our human definitions of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I think that parrots are, uh, are maybe more similar to us you know, cognitively in the brain than mm -hmm. most other birds are. Well, what are some proofs of that? Well, there's another YouTube video. <laughs> if you go on YouTube and type in Snowball the Dancing Cockatoo, <laughs> you get a very entertaining clip of this cockatoo rocking out to a Backstreet Boys song. <laughs> and that's another one that's gone viral. It's had millions of views in the past few years. But there was a neuroscientist who watched it and got to the end and thought to himself, well, that's interesting because I didn't think other animals except humans could dance to an external beat. And that takes a certain mental cognitive leap to be able to train your movements to some external sound. Well, I must be a real moron because I, I can't do it at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this parrot has moves, I tell you. But, uh, so they did an experiment where they sped up the song and they slowed down the song to different tempos and then played it for this dancing parrot. And every time he hears the music, he just goes crazy. <laughs> and sure enough, he would speed up his movements and slow down his movements and sync with the beat of the song. And that's pretty interesting. No other animal has ever been shown to train its movements to an external sound. There's lots of birds that dance, like uh -huh. cranes and things, but right. they always do it to their own sounds or silently. Uh -huh. And parrots don't really seem to do this in the wild either. I mean, obviously they don't rock out to the Backstreet Boys, <laughs> but they don't seem to time their movements to other sounds in the wild. So that probably just illustrates some cognitive ability that parrots have that we share. And it may even have something to do with the whole history of language and music and, and how language developed and music developed and, and how we ended up with this ability in the first place. Have you seen the video of a crow using a stick to uh, get it food? Yeah, I, crows are pretty good at that. Um, I've seen several videos like that. Where they figured out, I remember this one, he has to get... Uh, forget exactly what it is. He has to unravel something from a stick. He has to get the string figured out to get the stick out of the string. That's right. The, 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 the stick is entangled in a string, and he has to get that out. He has to go through several tasks in order to get the food. Uh, oh, I know what it is. The stick is not long enough to get the food, so he has to use that stick to get a longer stick to trade it for the stick long enough to get the food. It's quite an impressive uh, uh, cognitive feat. Oh, yeah. Solving multiple step problems like that is pretty amazing. Um, we tend to think of using tools at all as being pretty advanced, but that's even taking it to the next level. Back to pigeons for a minute. If one wanted to get into racing pigeons, I mean, how, how do you start that? How do you, you just get a pigeon and take him from home and let him fly back? I mean, what's, what's the procedure of training a pigeon? I'd say that most pigeons in the world may have some natural talent for navigation, uh -huh. but over generations and generations of pigeon breeding, we've mm -hmm. come up with a variety called the racing homer, mm -hmm. and that is specifically bred to come back home wherever you let it go. Mm -hmm. And so what you would want to do is you'd want to go get yourself some racer, racing homer pigeons. Mm -hmm. If you've got another variety, there's all kinds of different varieties of domestic pigeons now. There's like the tipplers and ones that go on endurance records and never land and all kinds of crazy things. But the racing homers are the ones that come back home. And this is something that, at least in my experience and the people I've talked to, is, is passed on through families and people will get uh, lofts of pigeons and then hand them down to their, their sons and they'll keep up their traditions. We live in the Rio Grande Valley down here, and uh, we have, of course, every year a big birding festival, the Rio Grande uh, Festival, and you're going to speak at this festival next year, right? That's right. I'll be giving a talk next November at the Lower Rio Grande Birding Festival. I'm really looking forward to it because I haven't been to the Lower Rio Grande Valley before. I got to visit Laredo uh -huh. earlier this year and Port Aransas, but I haven't quite been that far south yet. Well... I'm not part of the big, you know, birding movement. I'm not a, a 
a birder per se, although I am very aware that this is a kind of mecca for birders. Uh, do, what makes this such a special place for birds? Southern Texas is awesome for birding um, mm-hmm. compared to almost anywhere else in the United States. And it's partly because it's warm and almost subtropical down there. It's partly because you get a lot of Mexican species of birds that only barely make it across the border Mm -hmm. um, with the U.S. And so if you want to stay in American territory and still see Mexican birds, you can just go to southern Texas and see a lot of them down there. Mm -hmm. So that's what a lot of people do. And, And compared to almost anywhere else in the U.S., if you spend time in southern Texas, you can see more species of birds per hour than almost anywhere else. Really? I had had no idea that was so. There was a team of bird watchers last year that went on a 24-hour birding spree across Texas from mm-hmm. the from the coast inland to the hill country. Mm-hmm. And they ended up seeing almost 300 species of birds in less than 24 hours, which is a pretty awesome record. Wow, my goodness. How many species of birds have you seen? In, in my life, life in mm-hmm. the world, I've seen about 2,500 species of birds. And within the U.S., I think I've seen about 600 now. Not that I'm counting or anything. Worldwide, what is uh, the equivalent of the Rio Grande Valley? What's the best place in the world for birding? Yeah, the spot with the highest bird diversity in the world would be northwestern South America. So Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia. Mm-hmm each kind of vie with each other for the for boasting the highest country list of any country in the world and that's just because it's extremely diverse in that area there's a lot of rainforest and and lowland country but also you get a lot of different habitats so you have the coast and intermontane valleys and the high andes mountains and the lowland amazon all in a very small area so if you want to take an international bird watching trip and see the most species possible, that's the place to go. Here's a bizarre question for you. Uh, Someone once pointed out to me that you never see dead birds. They said, you know, there are billions of birds in the world, and they die, and... uh, uh, what happens to them? You know, you don't. You, That's once, true. Once in a while, when you animals s- die mm-hmm. in the wild, they get scavenged pretty uh-huh. quickly. Um, <laughs> I did an experiment a few years ago where I wanted to lure in turkey vultures to my yard, and mm-hmm. I realized I needed to put out a dead deer carcass in my yard. <laughs> Which is a whole other story um, to attract them. Uh-huh. But it took me about a month to find a good roadkill deer because it's just not that easy to find dead animals when uh-huh. you want one. Well, you and, want one. and the same is true of birds. <laughs> How, so you actually did attract some turkey vultures? Yeah, it was great. I, it was a hot summer afternoon. I uh. hauled this bloated, gaseous deer <laughs> carcass in the trunk of my car all the way home with my head hanging out the window because it smelled so bad. My parents, to their everlasting credit, were just like, well, keep it far enough from the house not to stink up the kitchen. So I put it out at the end of our, edge of our front yard and set up a blind next to it so I could really sit next to this reeking deer carcass and soak it up while the vultures came. And sure enough, the next morning, I woke up, and there were 25 turkey vultures sitting on the roof of our house. Oh, my. <laughs> it was great. So, and what did you do with them? I watched what you they did, and it was fascinating to watch them eat this dead deer. Uh-huh. They went at it very methodically. They ate the eyeballs and the gums first. And then they tore a hole in the side, and they started reaching in and pulling out all the innards and guts. And then it was kind of all over. They cleaned that whole deer down to bare bones in less than a week. So I guess that's why you don't see animal carcasses very often. Fascinating story. Well, Noah, I I wish that we could continue. I know you have have another interview you have to get to, so I'm going to have to let you go. Uh, but I look forward to seeing you here in the Rio Grande Valley next year. Your fascinating uh, interview, and I look forward to hearing more. The book is The Thing with Feathers by Noah Stryker, The Surprising Lives of Birds and What They Reveal About uh, Being Human. There's a great deal of praise for this book. It is, according to the Kirkus Reviews, a delightful book with broad appeal. 
In Publishers Weekly, they say that Stryker's prose is difficult to stop reading. And I must say that's true, story after good story. Uh, The Library Journal says it's a dazzling variety of avian subjects, including connections between birds and humans. Mary Pfeiffer says, I've read books about birds all my life, and this is the one I've been waiting for. Birds have a great deal to teach us, and Stryker loves birds. He understands their magic and mystery and can extrapolate from their behavior wisdom for us all. At last, we have a book worthy of this subject. And Brian Kimberling, author of Snapper, says this is a thoughtful, engaging book encompassing pigeon races, physics, vulture baiting, the Backstreet Boys, and a mathematical model applicable to both tennis rankings and chicken hierarchies, a work of dazzling range and nimbly written. I, too, recommend it highly. It's a wonderful read, The Thing with Feathers, You will enjoy it enormously. And if you love birds, you will love this book. For Good Books Radio and for audiobooks.com, I'm Dr. W.F. Strong. Have a great day. 